the Supreme Court has made a huge and unexpected decision which is uprooting gun laws all across the U.S. Let's dive in and find out what has happened. Landmark Supreme Court Decisions A landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision on the Second Amendment is upending gun laws across the country, dividing judges and sowing confusion over what firearm restrictions can remain on the books. The High Court's ruling that set new standards for evaluating gun laws left open many questions, experts say, resulting in an increasing number of conflicting decisions as lower court judges struggle to figure out how to apply it. The Supreme Court's so-called Bruin decision changed the test that lower courts had long used for evaluating challenges to firearm restrictions. Judges should no longer consider whether the law serves public interests, like enhancing public safety, the justices said. Under the Supreme Court's new test, the government that wants to uphold a gun restriction must look back into history to show it is consistent with the country's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Courts in recent months have declared unconstitutional federal laws designed to keep guns out of the hands of domestic attackers, felony defendants, and people who use marijuana. Judges have shot down a federal ban on processing guns with serial numbers removed and gun restrictions for young adults in Texas, and have blocked the enforcement of Delaware's ban on the possession of homemade ghost guns. In several instances, judges looking at the same laws have come down on opposite sides on whether they are constitutional in the wake of the conservative Supreme Court majority's ruling. The legal turmoil caused by the first major gun ruling in a decade will likely force the Supreme Court to step in again soon to provide more guidance for judges. Jacob Charles, a professor at Pepperdine University's law school who focuses on firearms law, said, There's confusion and disarray in the lower courts because not only are they not reaching the same conclusions, they're just applying different methods or applying Bruin's method differently. What it means is that not only are new laws being struck down, but also laws that have been on the books for over 60 years, 40 years in some cases, those are being struck down, where prior to Bruin, courts were unanimous that those were constitutional. The legal wrangling is playing out as mass shootings continue to plague the country awash in guns and as law enforcement officials across the U.S. work to combat an uptick in violent crime. In recent months of 2023, multiple people were fatally shot at multiple locations in a small town in rural Mississippi, and a gunman slayed three students and critically wounded five others at Michigan State University before slaying himself. Dozens of people have perished in mass shootings so far in 2023, including in California, where 11 people were slain as they welcomed the Lunar New Year at a dance hall popular with older Asian Americans. Last year, more than 600 mass shootings occurred in the U.S., in which at least four people were slain or wounded, according to the Gun Violence Archive. The decision opened the door to a wave of legal challenges from gun rights activists who saw an opportunity to undo laws on everything from age limits to AR-15-style semi-auto weapons. For gun rights supporters, the Bruin decision was a welcome development that removed what they see as unconstitutional restraints on Second Amendment rights. As this recent decision struck down the New York law that restricted the concealed carry of handguns, it has opened the door to challenges to other gun control laws. If the Supreme Court were to rule that the Second Amendment protects the right to own suppressors, it would be a major victory for gun rights advocates. The Bruin Case Verdict The issue around the right to carry guns in public in the United States has been a contested area in politics and constitutional law for most of the 21st century. Prior to the case, the Supreme Court established two major decisions toward gun possession in one's home. District of Columbia v. Heller affirmed that U.S. citizens did have an individual right, unconnected to a well-regulated militia, to possess guns within their own homes under the Second Amendment, and McDonald v. City of Chicago affirmed this was a right that was incorporated against the states. However, the question of ownership outside of one's home had not yet reached the Supreme Court and instead was based on an inconsistent framework of state laws and federal court decisions. Wyme says the Missouri law exposes people to greater harm by interfering with the federal government's ability to enforce firearms regulations. These decisions were generally based on long-standing common law that the government does have the ability to regulate firearms in public spaces to uphold state regulations on public gun possession. Across over 1,000 cases since Heller, most federal appeals courts have used intermediate rather than strict scrutiny to judge the validity of public carry gun control laws, which defer to the state's compelling interest to protect the public by restricting possession of guns in public spaces. 
to combat growing criminal violence in certain neighborhoods of New York City, including the assassination attempt on New York City Mayor William J. Gaynor and the slaying of author David Graham Phillips, Timothy Sullivan led the state legislature to enact the Sullivan Act in 1911. It made the possession of a handgun without a permit a crime and instituted issuance of concealed carry permits at the discretion of local law enforcement. The law states that to obtain a permit, the applicant must demonstrate a special need for self-protection distinguishable from that of the general community or of persons engaged in the same profession. The state had clarified that this must be a non-speculative need for self-defense as to establish a proper cause to grant a permit. The New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, along with Robert Nash and Brandon Koch, who failed to obtain a permit in New York State, challenged that law, seeking to make the issue of permits no longer discretionary. Nash, for example, sought a permit for a handgun after a string of robberies in his neighborhood, but was denied as he could not prove a need for self-defense. The plaintiffs argued that the law and judgments against their permits were flawed. Good, even impeccable moral character, plus a simple desire to exercise a fundamental right, is according to these courts, not sufficient, nor is living or being employed in a high-crime area. The Sullivan Act is considered the first May-issue public carry law in the U.S., since the discretion on allowing a person to carry a gun in public is based on the evaluation of need, which seven other states adopted from New York. This is in contrast to more recent shall-issue licensing requirements based on determinant methods such as using background checks and aptitude checks to determine eligibility. The petitioners had asked the Supreme Court to review their case, specifically pressing the question of whether the Second Amendment allows the government to prohibit ordinary law-abiding citizens from carrying handguns outside the home for self-defense. The Supreme Court granted Satiriorari on April 26, 2021, although it limited the case to the question of whether the state's denial of petitioners' applications for concealed carry licenses for self-defense violated the Second Amendment. The case was heard on November 3, 2021, and was the first major gun rights case that the Supreme Court had heard in more than a decade. And within less than 15 minutes, you can walk out the front door here with a rifle or a shotgun. It was also the first gun rights case to be heard by the six-member conservative majority, which included Justices Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh, who in prior opinions had emphasized the need for the Supreme Court to review the current stance on Second Amendment cases. The case's decision was released on June 23, 2022. In a 6-3 opinion authored by Justice Clarence Thomas, the court held that the state law was unconstitutional as it infringed on the right to keep and bear arms, reversing the Second Circuit's decision and remanding the case for further review. Thomas's majority opinion, joined by Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, effectively rendered public carry a constitutional right under the Second Amendment. Thomas wrote, the constitutional right to bear arms in public for self-defense is not a second-class right, subject to an entirely different body of rules than the other Bill of Rights guarantees. We know of no other constitutional right that an individual may exercise only after demonstrating to government officers some special need. The court's decision in Bruin was a major victory for gun rights advocates. The court's ruling overturned a long-standing precedent that had allowed states to impose strict restrictions on the concealed carry of firearms. The decision also opened the doors to challenges to other gun control laws, such as bans on other weapons and high-capacity mags. The Bruin decision has been met with mixed reactions. Gun rights advocates have praised the decision, arguing that it will help to protect their Second Amendment rights. Gun control advocates have criticized the decision, arguing that it will make it easier for people to carry guns in public, which could lead to an increase in gun violence. Reactions Across the Nation Gun control groups are raising alarm after a federal appeals court in 2023 said that under the Supreme Court's new standards, the government can't stop people who have domestic violence restraining orders against them from owning guns. The New Orleans-based 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals acknowledged that the law embodies salutary policy goals meant to protect vulnerable people in our society. But the judges concluded that the government failed to point to a precursor from an early American history that is comparable enough to the modern law. Attorney General Merrick Garland has said that the government will seek further review of that decision. Gun control activists have decried the Supreme Court's historical test, but say they remain confident that many gun restrictions will survive challenges. Since the decision, for example, 
judges have consistently upheld the federal ban on convicted felons from possessing guns. The Supreme Court noted that cases dealing with unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes may require a more nuanced approach, and the justices clearly emphasize that the right to bear arms is limited to law-abiding citizens, said Shira Feldman, litigation counsel for Brady, the gun control group. The Supreme Court's test has raised questions about whether judges are suited to be poring over history and whether it makes sense to judge modern laws based on regulations or lack thereof from the past. We are not experts in that white, wealthy, and male property owners thought about firearms regulation in 1791, yet we are now expected to play historian in the name of constitutional adjudication," wrote Mississippi U.S. District Judge Carlton Reeves, who was appointed by President Barack Obama. Firearm rights and gun control groups are closely watching many pending cases, including several challenging state laws banning certain semi-auto weapons and high-capacity magazines. A federal judge in Chicago recently denied a bid to block an Illinois law that bans the sale of so-called attack weapons and high-capacity mags, finding the law to be constitutional under the Supreme Court's new test. A state court, however, already has partially blocked the law, allowing some gun dealers to continue selling the weapons amid a separate legal challenge. Already, some gun laws passed in the wake of the Supreme Court decision have been shot down. A judge declared multiple portions of New York's new gun law unconstitutional, including rules that restrict carrying firearms in public parks and places of worship. An appeals court later put that ruling on hold while it considers the case, and the Supreme Court has allowed New York to enforce the law for now. Some judges have upheld a law banning people under indictment for felonies from buying guns, while others have declared it unconstitutional. In the California case, U.S. District Judge George Wu, who was nominated by President George W. Bush, appeared to take a dig at how other judges are interpreting the Supreme Court's guidance. The company that brought the challenge, and apparently certain other courts, would like to treat the Supreme Court's decision as a word salad, choosing an ingredient from one side of the plate, an entirely separate ingredient from the other, until there is nothing left whatsoever other than an entirely bulletproof and unrestrained Second Amendment, Wu wrote in his ruling. Modern Arms Second Amendment Modern arms, despite the claims of anti-gun activists, are indeed protected by the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. While anti-gun activists argue that the right to bear arms should not extend to contemporary firearms, a thorough examination of the Second Amendment's principles and the evolving nature of self-defense always reveals the continued relevance of modern arms within its protections. To understand the Second Amendment's applicability to modern arms, it is essential to consider the historical context in which it was written. When the amendment was ratified in 1791, muskets and rifles were the predominant firearms of the time. Critics contend that the framers could not have anticipated the technological advancements that have since occurred in the field of weaponry. While this is undoubtedly true, it is important to remember that the underlying principles of self-defense and individual liberty that the Second Amendment upholds remain unchanged. The interpretation of the Second Amendment has been a subject of intense debate. However, the Supreme Court has consistently affirmed that the right to bear arms is an individual right, distinct from militia service. Like we have seen in key cases such as District of Columbia v. Heller and McDonald v. City of Chicago, the Court clarified that the Second Amendment protects the right to self-defense within the home and encompasses firearms in common use for lawful purposes. Consequently, modern firearms, which are widely owned and commonly used for self-defense, fall within the ambit of constitutional protection. Self-defense is a fundamental aspect of the Second Amendment's purpose. Modern firearms provide individuals with the means to protect themselves and their loved ones from immediate threats. The possession of firearms with features like semi-auto capabilities and higher capacity mags offers a significant advantage in emergency situations. These modern arms enable law-abiding citizens to respond effectively to potential harm, thereby enhancing their personal safety. By deterring criminals and providing a means of self-defense, modern firearms contribute to the overall security of individuals and communities. In addition to self-defense, the protection of modern arms under the Second Amendment acknowledges the evolving nature of the threats faced by citizens. Technological advancements have empowered criminals, but they have also empowered law-abiding individuals to confront and mitigate those threats effectively. From home invasions to mass shootings, the right to possess modern firearms ensures that citizens have access to tools that match the capabilities of those who seek to do harm. 
Stripping individuals of the ability to defend themselves with modern arms would create an imbalance, leaving law-abiding citizens vulnerable to those who are willing to break the law. The argument against modern arms often revolves around the notion that they are unnecessary or excessive for self-defense purposes. However, the Second Amendment does not dictate the specific types of firearms protected. Instead, it upholds the principle that individuals have the right to possess arms that are in common use and suitable for lawful purposes. Modern firearms clearly fall within this definition as they are widely owned and used by law-abiding citizens for self-defense, sport shooting, and other lawful activities. So attempts to restrict or ban modern arms based on their aesthetic features or capabilities undermine the core principles of the Second Amendment. The focus should be on addressing the underlying causes of violence and crime rather than targeting the tools used by criminals. Responsible firearm ownership, education, and comprehensive background checks are effective means of addressing concerns related to public safety without infringing on the rights protected by the Second Amendment. Selling more guns in the last three weeks than we did in the last eight months. Furthermore, firearm technology has evolved significantly since the framing of the Second Amendment. Alongside advancements in firearms themselves, various accessories have emerged to enhance their functionality and safety. Suppressors, developed to reduce the noise and muzzle flash of firearms, have become increasingly prevalent in contemporary firearm use. Though originally invented in the early 20th century, modern suppressors now incorporate advanced materials, designs, and manufacturing techniques, solidifying their status as modern arms. The Second Amendment guarantees the right to bear arms, encompassing firearms in common use for lawful purposes. While some argue that suppressors are not intended for self-defense and thus should not be protected, this overlooks their significant practical applications. Suppressors play a crucial role in hearing protection, reducing noise pollution, and minimizing recoil, contributing to safer shooting experiences. Their use in hunting can help mitigate noise disturbances and improve accuracy. As such, suppressors fall within the purview of the Second Amendment's protections for modern arms. Suppressors have often been subject to misconceptions perpetuated by media portrayals and popular culture. Contrary to their depiction as tools exclusively utilized by criminals or assassins, suppressors primarily serve lawful purposes such as recreational shooting, hunting, and home defense. Acknowledging their lawful applications and demystifying their capabilities are crucial steps towards understanding why suppressors should be protected under the Second Amendment. The inclusion of suppressors in the category of modern arms aligns with the objective of promoting firearm safety and accessibility. By mitigating the loud noise associated with firearm discharge, suppressors help reduce hearing damage risks, making shooting ranges and hunting environments safer for both firearm users and bystanders. Their use can make shooting activities more accessible to individuals who may be sensitive to loud noises or have heightened auditory concerns. While acknowledging suppressors as modern arms, it is important to emphasize the need for responsible ownership and regulation. Striking a balance between individual rights and public safety, the implementation of thorough background checks, training requirements, and registration processes can ensure responsible usage and deter misuse. Such measures can address concerns regarding the potential misuse of suppressors while upholding the rights protected by the Second Amendment. Despite the claims of anti-gun activists, modern arms and suppressors are pretty much protected by the Second Amendment. The right to bear arms extends to firearms that are in common use for lawful purposes, including those that have seen technological advancements. The Second Amendment acknowledges the changing dynamics of self-defense and the need for individuals to adapt to evolving threats, and so suppressors, as modern arms, deserve protection under the Second Amendment. Their evolution in design and functionality aligns with the broader advancements in firearm technology. Texas AG sues ATF In another interesting bit in this situation, it's a long shot, but Texans may soon be able to make firearm suppressors without going through the federal process. In accordance with a new state law, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton sued the ATF in an effort to stop the federal government from regulating silencers that are made in Texas. Federal laws and regulations which tax and regulate the making of firearm suppressors in Texas for personal use in Texas impinge upon a right protected by the Second Amendment, the lawsuit reads. The state law, House Bill 957 by Rep. Tom Oliverson, 
attempts to exempt Texas-made suppressors from federal regulation. The Attorney General himself, Ken Paxton, tweeted saying, quote, what we just witnessed is illegal. The Texas House of Representatives just voted to impeach Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. He went on to say he looks forward to a quick resolution in the Texas Senate. We're demonstrating that blind loyalty to Speaker Dade Phelan is more important than upholding their oath of office. Ever since gangland crimes like the St. Valentine's Day slaying spurred Congress to pass the National Firearms Act in 1934, citizens have had to pay the ATF $200 for a tax stamp to purchase suppressors. Federal regulations also require suppressors to be registered in a national registry. Manufacturers must have a license with the ATF to make suppressors, and even individuals that want to make suppressors for personal use must pay the tax stamp and get advance approval from the ATF. HB 957 says these regulations do not apply to suppressors made in Texas and also forbids state and local police from enforcing federal suppressor regulations. However, to keep regular citizens out of trouble with the ATF, it first directs the Texas Attorney General to seek a declaration from a federal court that HB 957 is constitutional on behalf of a Texan looking to manufacture a Texas-made suppressor. The ATF warned licensees in Texas that it would still enforce federal law even after the passage of HB 957. After months passed with no action from Paxton, most suppressor companies in Texas remained dubious that HB 957 would actually work. Because the companies risk losing their licenses for violating the NFA, one owner suggested that an individual might be better suited to contact Paxton and challenge the law. Paxton filed his lawsuit on behalf of three Texans who told him they intend to make suppressors for personal use that will remain in Texas. The citizens say suppressors would enable them to defend their homes without earplugs, allowing greater alertness without the risk of hearing damage. Oliverson, a medical doctor, presented similar arguments when laying out the bill on the floor of the Texas House. In the brief, Paxton argues that the federal government has no compelling interest in suppressor regulation that could outweigh the Second Amendment and supporting precedent like D.C. v. Heller. Specifically, Paxton claims the $200 tax stamp does not generate revenue, failing even to pay the cost of collecting the tax itself, and that suppressors pose no obvious criminal danger as opposed to items like grenades. The government cannot demonstrate that taxation and regulation of firearm suppressors, unlike dangerous items like hand grenades, is necessary for public health and safety. The government cannot point to any harm that taxing and regulating firearm suppressors alleviates, the lawsuit reads. Calling the inclusion of suppressors in the NFA merely a historical accident, Paxton notes that Congress landed on the $200 price tag since that was the average cost of a Mac gun at the time. Additionally, the NFA definition of firearm excludes most guns, such as common long shotguns or rifles, but includes suppressors and their component parts if their owners intend to use them to build suppressors. Thus, a metal pipe is a firearm subject to taxation and regulation under the National Firearms Act of 1934 if the owner of the metal pipe intends to incorporate it into a firearm suppressor. Other metal pipes are not defined as firearms in the statute according to Paxton. Other NFA firearms include short shotguns and rifles, mash guns and grenades, making suppressors the only gun accessory in the law. Paxton is seeking two permanent injunctions. One would stop the ATF from assessing the tax stamp. The other would stop the ATF from enforcing federal gun regulations that impose duties besides taxes on the making of suppressors in Texas for personal use in Texas. More broadly, he also seeks the declaration that federal regulation on suppressors is not a valid exercise of power. Gun control advocates support government regulation of silencers to keep them out of the hands of criminals. They argue silencers make it harder to locate a shooter's location, hampering police response to shootings. Muffled gunshots also reduce the chance of bystanders reporting gunfire to police, the group say. But most Texans don't seem to agree. After all, Texas, the second most populous state, led the U.S. in 2020 for the number of manufacturers and dealers of silencers, as well as other specialized weapons, such as short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, and mash guns, according to ATF. Texas, as of May 2021, had more registered silencers than any other state, with more than 520,000. Florida was second, with more than 175,000 registered silencers. California, the most populous state in the U.S., had a little more than 17,000 registered silencers.
Challenges to gun law. The Supreme Court left intact a federal law that requires the registration of some firearms, including silencers, and turned away a request to consider whether such firearm accessories are protected by the Second Amendment. An appeals court had held that a silencer is not a bearable arm protected by the Constitution. The case comes as a silencer was used during the recent Virginia Beach massacre and President Donald Trump blatantly denying the power grab being carried out by the executive branch yet again. The uptick in violence has just been astronomical. Um, the gun violence. As a kid, I came out of a different movement, the civil rights movement. Those who showed up here said one thing that felt good about doing this kind of event was that they felt empowered. Pretty clear about the extent to which this is an abuse of the Administrative Procedures Act. Is it a difficult question to understand? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure it's enormously high. It's 36 for 100,000 people. With it off safe, um, just that little bit of motion, you can hear the click. Suggested he'd look into restrictions on gun silencers. The Trump administration had also urged the court not to take up the issue. The order was issued without comment or recorded dissent. Shane Cox owned an Armley surplus store in Kansas, where he sold unregistered homemade silencers, and Jeremy Kettler bought one of them. They were convicted under the National Firearms Act, passed in 1934, which requires individuals to register silencers and to pay a federal tax of about $200. The law has the effect of limiting the number of silencers, but not banning them. Because he doesn't care about separation of powers either. The Texas House of Representatives just voted to impeach Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. How many guns has the ATF lost? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. It will shoot, then it comes back forward. The rifle will then cycle and, and cock again. The extent to which this is an unconstitutional violation of our Second Amendment rights. But what is also true is that it is incumbent upon the United States Congress House of Representatives in particular. Wyam says the Missouri law exposes people to greater harm by interfering with the federal government's ability to enforce firearms regulations. It also makes it harder to transfer them. Eight states and Washington, D.C. go further and ban silencers altogether. Others ban them unless registered with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Court experts did not expect the court to take up this issue, but believe justices are more likely to look at other issues concerning public carry and assault weapons. Some believe the lower courts are thumbing their nose at the landmark Heller v. U.S. decision in 2008, holding that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to keep and bear arms. Earlier in this term, the justices did agree, however, to take up a Second Amendment case for next term about a New York City gun law. And having to tell her that other nine-year-olds were just killed in a shooting is, is horrific. Field background checks could stop a lot of illegal guns going in different places in the country. This shall not be infringed, and the word infringe means by banning parts on firearms <clears throat> actually is against the Constitution. It takes extraordinary courage for them to stand up here and retell the story. Anti-gunners put in there to keep the guns out of the hands of lawful, uh, lawful citizens in New York State. <laughs> affect us here and uh, I, you know it was such a breath of fresh air for the for the second amendment people concerning the transport of guns outside the home expanding gun rights in a major expansion of gun rights after a series of mass shootings the supreme court said that americans have a right to carry firearms in public for self-defense a ruling likely to lead to more people legally armed the decision came out as congress and states debate gun control legislation about one quarter of the U.S. population lives in states expected to be affected by the ruling, which struck down a New York gun law. In June of 2021, you changed the department's asylum rules so that it could apply to individuals with significant gang violence. Most apparent here, a defense of the Second Amendment, which this most certainly is. Wyam says the Missouri law exposes people to greater harm by interfering with the federal government's ability to enforce firearms regulations.
we can expect in the future that more people will be carrying handguns on the streets in places like Los Angeles, Boston, and New York City. As many of you out there, either parents, relatives, and or victims yourself. To do anything about what the president is doing to exercise that authority unconstitutionally, as was the case with student loans. Because people buy hundreds of guns legally and then they sell them illegally. The high court's first major gun decision in more than a decade split the court six to three, with the court's conservatives in the majority and liberals in dissent. Across the street from the court, lawmakers at the Capitol sped toward passage of gun legislation prompted by recent massacres in Texas, New York, and California. Senators cleared the way for the measure, modest in scope, but still the most far-reaching in decades. Inventing the pistol-stabilizing brace to help his friend, a disabled combat veteran, at the shooting range. You gave testimony that the brave ATF agents are the ones showing up at two in the morning after a burglary. Do any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle give a wit about separation of powers? Connecticut delegation, which is incredible. I think on this issue and many others, you're the best delegation in the United States. No guns were lost. They were stolen by an individual who's now in prison. And of course, we've gotten a lot of criticism over this. So why is it not a machine gun? In areas that are poor, mostly minority, there's a mass shooting. Congress wants to change the law and come up with a new interpretation, then ATF will follow that new interpretation. She, she proves you can run for office and in gun violence in the South and you can win. AK-47 is an automatic Kalashnikov model of 1947. You can prevent the next tragedy, you can save life, you can save families. In the process. Thought it just like, wow, it doesn't fit the definition, it doesn't fit the rulings, but we better run this up the chain. Some months later, during an ATF audit, I was told the background check was now a non-approval. Because they like the outcome of the policy, the banning of a piece of plastic. Highlighting the nation's profound divisions on the matter, the sister of a nine-year-old girl who was killed in the Uvalde, Texas school shooting pleaded with state lawmakers to pass gun legislation. The Republican-controlled legislature, which has steadily removed gun restrictions over the past decade, remains at the center of the debate. President Joe Biden expressed his deep disappointment with the Supreme Court ruling in a statement. He stated that the ruling contradicts both common sense and the Constitution and should be a cause for concern for all citizens. The president called upon states to enact new laws, urging Americans across the country to raise their voices on the issue of gun safety emphasizing that lives are at stake. That requirement for showing a heightened need for self-defense, that was the teeth of these permitting laws. And within less than 15 minutes, you can walk out the front door here with a rifle or a shotgun. American citizens in places like New Orleans and Baltimore and St. Louis begin to seek asylum in countries like Honduras and Guatemala. I don't know if you're referring to uh, any particular incident or to run enhanced background checks on young people under 21 trying to buy a firearm. This government can protect its own people except for 36 out of every 100,000 for murders. Types of disputes that would be settled by people yelling at each other, maybe engaging in a fist fight, are being settled with guns. The Supreme Court's decision invalidated a New York law that required individuals to demonstrate a specific need for carrying a concealed firearm in public in order to obtain a license. The justices concluded that this requirement violates the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote for the majority that the Constitution protects an individual's right to carry a handgun for self-defense outside the home. That right is not a second-class right, Thomas wrote. We know of no other constitutional right that an individual may exercise only after demonstrating to government officers some special need. California, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Rhode Island all have laws similar to New York's. Those laws are expected to be quickly challenged. Governor Kathy Hochul, Democrat New York, said the ruling came at a particularly painful time, with New York mourning the deaths of 10 people in a shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo. This decision isn't just reckless, it's reprehensible. It's not what New Yorkers want, she said. I am just inspired by the next generation. I think it's uh, a time for a big change. Since you rewrote the rules of asylum based on the perceived 
degree of violence in these countries. Selling more guns in the last three weeks than we did in the last eight months. But for me, and for most of you, here's what it really is. It's an important first step. When somebody bump fires, think of this as a bump fire stock and able to move. To be clear, this wasn't based on violence. This is ba based on threats, specifically to individuals, on gangs. I don't really see the purpose of bringing, letting other people that don't really know what harm they can do. You specifically said that. Uh, but I said... The, what, this, is mandat what does mandatory mean? I'm trying to say that... It means that prosecutors get a choice. I would expect to see in the, the coming months and years is a lot of focus on whether or not enough places are deemed sensitive right now. The Attorney General himself, Ken Paxton, tweeted saying, quote, what we just witnessed is illegal. Gun control groups called the decision a significant setback. Michael Waldman, president of the Brennan Center for Justice and an expert on the Second Amendment, wrote on Twitter that the decision could be the biggest expansion of gun rights by the Supreme Court in U.S. history. Republican lawmakers were among those cheering the decision. Tom King, president of the plaintiff New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, said he was relieved. We are not finished. We are not finished. We are not finished. Not one more! Not one more! Not one more! The most serious readily provable offenses in cases where mandatory minimums are present because it's not warranted. The sensitive places doctrine was not at issue in this case and still exists. He went on to say he looks forward to a quick resolution in the Texas Senate. So what happens is I pull the gun into my trigger finger. Who are prepared and, and carry a gun oftentimes have to make split sec second decisions. The lawful and legal gun owner of New York State is no longer going to be persecuted by laws that have nothing to do with the safety of the people and will do nothing to make the people safer, he said. And maybe now we'll start going after criminals and perpetrators of these heinous acts. The court's decision is somewhat out of step with public opinion. About half of the voters in the 2020 presidential election said gun laws in the U.S. should be made stricter according to AP VoteCast, an expansive survey of the electorate. An additional one-third said laws should be kept as they are, while only about one in ten said gun laws should be less strict. The conventional wisdom was we would never get any Republicans to support gun legislation, period. Are ones where, in fact, it's most likely that they should be bringing the highest and uh, mandatory minimum. <laughs> Details of the law, but folks, listen to it at home. Here's a quick summary of what this law is doing. It's already allowing. We're demonstrating that blind loyalty to Speaker Dade Phelan is more important than upholding their oath of office. Might end up being a message amendment because the President of the United States will almost assuredly veto it. Justice Brett Kavanaugh and Chief Justice John Roberts criticized the Supreme Court's decision to strike down New York's law on concealed handguns in public. They noted that states can still require people to obtain a license to carry a gun and condition that license on fingerprinting, background checks, mental health records checks, and training in firearms handling and force laws. Gun violence has increased during the coronavirus pandemic and gun purchases have also risen. New York's law, in place since 1913, requires a specific need to carry the weapon. The New York State Rifle and Pistol Association and two men sought an unrestricted ability to carry guns outside their homes. What about Columbia? I, I don't know. 23 for 100,000. It's ludicrous. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. We are the lawful, legal citizens of the state. Holding it a certain way, it'll continue to bump back and forth against my trigger finger. Which many have described as the most significant gun safety law in 30 years, and it is. The Supreme Court last issued a major gun decision in 2010, establishing a nationwide right to keep a gun at home for self-defense. Justice Stephen Breyer criticized the ruling, arguing that it would severely burden states. Efforts to pass laws that limit who may purchase, carry, or use firearms of different kinds. Other conservative justices also contributed to the discussion. Justice Samuel Alito criticized Breyer's dissent, questioning the relevance of his discussion of mass shootings and other gun death statistics. Controversial Expansion of Arm Regulations 
Private arms owners are being forced to tighten their grip on the federal agency that is responsible for supervising the highly regulated arm industry by the administration of President Joe Biden. The administration is asserting that private arm owners are engaged in the business if they sell arms privately and promise to sell more. The statement that the arms business is the enemy was made by President Joe Biden during the debate stage in 2019. This is just the most recent salvo that he has fired. An unrelenting attack of historically high arm license revocations under the guise of its zero-tolerance policy has resulted in the ATF snuffing out arm retailers at a record pace. The administration has unilaterally proposed an expansion of the definition of who is required to obtain a dealer's license and therefore run a national instant criminal background check system verification in order to transfer an arm. This comes at a time when the ATF is snuffing out arm retailers at a record pace. As you may recall, it is a criminal offense to fail to get a dealer's license when it is needed by law. Additionally, this most recent gamble goes beyond the statutory jurisdiction that the ATF possesses. The requirement is not feasible in any way. There is no way that the ATF could keep up with the increasing number of federal arm licenses, which is 328,000. When Congress takes a position against President Joe Biden's infringement on the rights of citizens, he continues to plow through the legislative process in an attempt to develop legislation that violates the Constitution. After admitting that he is powerless to do anything without the action of Congress, he comes to this conclusion. As suppressors, illegal nationwide, just as they are in New Jersey. Do something about gun violence. Thank God. Thank God we did. Three round bursts or semi-automatic. Those firearms are not allowed for purchase in the United States today. The Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Unilaterally making law and criminals. Merrick Garland, the Attorney General of the United States, made the announcement of the proposed rule that would redefine the definition of engaged in the business. The rule would also require a federal arms license and a background check from the NICS when selling or transferring an arm, in addition to requiring the maintenance of all the necessary records and paperwork. The Department of Justice has admitted that in order for a universal background check program to function properly, it would require a federal arm registry. This is a thinly veiled attempt to construct such a scheme. That is against the law at the federal level. In the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, Congress provided clarification on the term engaged in the business. This is an ironic turn of events. Congress made a single word amendment to the definition of engaged in the business by deleting the word livelihood from the act which the courts had essentially read out of the statute. The definition of an armed dealer remains the same as it was in the past, a person who devotes time, attention, and labor to dealing in arms as a regular course of trade or business to predominantly earn a profit through the repetitive purchase and resale of arms. However, this definition does not include individuals who make occasional sales, exchanges, or purchases of arms for the purpose of enhancing a personal collection or for a hobby, or who sells all or part of his personal collection of arms. There was no reason for the government to publish 108 pages in order to clarify a term that had just been changed, unless the administration was aiming to take away the rights guaranteed by the Second Amendment from Congress and the people. But the administration of President Joe Biden is going too far by asserting that they have orders from Congress when it is abundantly evident that they do not. The mandate that Congress issued to extend the definition of who is required to obtain a license and perform a background check prior to selling arms is being implemented by this proposed rule, according to the Attorney General Garland. According to Fox News, the proposed rule would require any individual selling weapons online or at arms how to be licensed and to conduct background checks prior to completing the sale. This requirement would be subject to public comment and final approval. According to a report by the Associated Press, the Department of Justice believes that the proposed rule will affect as many as 328,000 private persons. 
On Tuesday, a new bill was signed into law that outlaws the sale and manufacturing of semi-automatic assault weapons. Makers of the silencers are the ones pushing state lawmakers to lift the ban, and they have found at least one supporter. Law enforcement later surmised he was shot by someone using a silencer. For years, the Democrats told us we're not coming for your guns. Oh, yes, they are. Make no mistake about it. This legislation is real progress, but more has to be done. And they're coming for your firearms. Six weeks ago, it was the red flag law. Congressional brushback. In a move that is not exclusive to this administration, the legislative alterations that the Biden administration has made to the BSCA have been met with widespread disapproval by the public. It is becoming increasingly difficult for the proposal to support itself, and Congress is pushing back against the administration. This language is tailored towards individuals who regularly sell arms to strangers with the predominant motive of making money through a side business, such as the person who sold the weapon to the shooter in Midland, and it is drafted in such a way that prosecutors will need to prove specific intent on the part of the unlicensed seller, said officials at the office of United States Senator John Cornyn, Texas. Cornyn is a Republican from Texas. This rule is unlawful, and the administration of President Joe Biden ought to anticipate that it will be overturned. Senator Joni Ernst's office stated that any efforts to expand licensing beyond the bounds that were previously established would be in direct opposition to the intention of Congress. According to statements made to the media by the senator's staff, President Biden is twisting the law to fit his liberal arm-grabbing agenda. It is very evident that the most recent attack on lawful arm owners by his administration goes beyond both the meaning and the wording of the statute, and it does so at the expense of the typical arm seller. Senator Ernst has been a staunch supporter of those who hold a Florida driver's license, and he will continue to take a position against the attack on Second Amendment rights that the Biden administration is launching. This is a lever action. Under this bill, lever actions apparently are okay. The state house still has to vote on the bill. Nine on your side's Craig Smith looked into how much difference a suppressor makes. Piece of legislation and voting on whether this nation is going to be all in on a new nuclear arms race. The number of so-called assault rifles, which you all are calling assault rifles, had doubled. Focus on criminals. The broadening of the definition of an arm dealer that was carried out unilaterally is not only unlawful, but also a breach of the Administrative Procedures Act, which will be overturned by the legislative branch. This is not only a waste of important resources and time, but it also represents a misallocation of resources that should be used to pursue criminals who intentionally breach the law. It is not appropriate for the ATF to employ its enforcement efforts to chase down an armed hobbyist who sells an occasional arm or an uncle who gives a treasured hunting rifle to his niece. Gunsmithing and the construction of arms at home have, of course, been common hobbies among people in the USA since before the country was established. As a result of expanding the definition of a dealer, the ATF would now be responsible for monitoring and requiring registration of up to 328,000 Americans that it currently considers to be arm dealers. This is the case even if these individuals only make occasional sales, exchanges, or purchases of arms for the purpose of enhancing a personal collection or a hobby, or if they sell all or part of a personal arm collection. A person must commit time, attention, and labor to dealing in weapons as a regular course of trade or business in order to primarily earn a profit via the recurrent purchase and resale of arms in order to be considered a dealer. This criteria was not altered by Congress. A sufficient amount of burden appears to be placed on the agency's workload. From the 1st of October until the present day, the ATF has already carried out 6,609 inspections of federal arms licenses. The sum of 7,502 for the entire year of 2022 is quite near to being reached by this. The fact that licenses are already being revoked at a rate of 122 is even more frightening. All of the fiscal year 2022 had a total of 92. Legitimate business will come to a complete standstill as a result of the drain on the resources of the ATF that will be required to administer this proposed rule. The NSSF represents the actual regulated industry. Under these circumstances, 
the ATF will be unable to provide the industry with the essential customer service it requires, such as the processing of import permits, paperwork for creating and transferring suppressors, and classification determinations on new goods. The arms business will move from zero tolerance to zero lawful, constitutionally protected commerce, which may be an indication that there is a hidden agenda behind the rule. It is ironic that under the Clinton administration, arms control organizations, most notably Handgun Control Inc., which has since been renamed Brady United, expressed their vehement displeasure with the fact that there were an excessive number of kitchen table dealers and that the ATF did not possess the resources necessary to inspect and license each and every one of them. It appears that many who advocate for stricter arm control are unable to make up their minds and have completely changed their position on this matter. By using the Anti-Terrorism Bureau as a sledgehammer against law-abiding arm owners and turning them into criminals overnight, President Biden is abusing both the Constitution and the ability of the executive branch to exercise power. When Congress has made it clear that it does not intend to do so, he is redefining and creating new laws. Clearly, the proposed rule constitutes an unconstitutional attack on the right to lawfully possess arms. For that reason, uh, these things aren't oftentimes falling into the wrong hand. It's time we do the same. Ban assault weapons now! Ban them now! Investigators later determined the shootings went unreported simply because no one heard them. Keeping guns out of the hands of people who are a danger to themselves and others. But we know our work is not done. Well, the Arizona Senate has passed a bill to make it easier to own a gun silencer, more accurately called a suppressor. GOP resolution against its pistol brace ban. White House reaffirmed its support for the prohibition on pistol braces that was implemented by the Biden administration. Additionally, the White House threatened to veto a resolution that has been linked to the mutiny of the conservatives in the House. Factoring criteria for arms with attached stabilizing braces is a rule that was announced by the Biden administration in January on behalf of the ATF of the Department of Justice. The Republican resolution expresses disapproval of this rule. The rule, which has been a target of conservatives ever since Attorney General Merrick Garland announced it, would reclassify pistols that have a stabilizing brace as short-barreled rifles and require individuals who already possess pistols that have stabilizing braces to have them registered with the government by the 31st of May 2023. However, the resolution's sponsor, Representative Andrew Clyde, stated that the leadership of the Republican Party advised him that it would be difficult to bring the resolution to the floor if he did not support passing the debt ceiling accord during the previous week. It was claimed by Fox News that House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, a Republican from Louisiana, has refuted the assertion and stated that leadership is attempting to bring it to the floor discussion. The president made it abundantly apparent that he would place a veto on the resolution if it were to reach his desk. According to the statement of administration policy issued by the White House, even though congressional Republicans should take additional action to keep these and other dangerous weapons off our streets, they are instead pushing a resolution to reverse this rule and the progress we have made to enforce existing statutory requirements on these dangerous weapons. There are a number of reasons why this is the case. As a result of the horrific shooting that occurred in Nashville, Tennessee, the House Judiciary Committee decided to postpone the marking up of a resolution to nullify the regulation that was scheduled to take place in March. As stated in the statement released by the White House, the rationale is clear. Short-barreled rifles are more concealable than long arms, yet more dangerous and accurate at a distance than traditional pistols. When attached to a firearm, does not convert that weapon to be fired from the shoulder. Those are accessories to semi-automatic rifles that increase the rate of fire. That this bill would ban weapons that are in common use in the United States today. And would not alter, would not alter the classification of a pistol or other firearm. Is the goal of the ATF to go after and criminalize law-abiding Americans? We don't, it, that's not for us to regulate. If somebody simply, we wrote the rule to make it easy to comply with. This statement detailed the fact that Congress placed restrictions on the possession of these arms in 1934. According to the statement, 
Recently, however, the arm industry has circumvented this long-standing law by manufacturing and selling so-called stabilizing braces that convert heavy pistols into short-barreled rifles. This law has been in place for a significantly long time. It was mentioned that the brace devices were utilized on handguns by the individuals who carried out recent mass slings like those that occurred in Dayton, Ohio and Boulder, Colorado. on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles like the one used by the sick perpetrator of this mass killing. It's been happening everywhere all the time because you, Congress, have done nothing to prevent it. Here's the amount of gun violence that has happened. I think we're reaching a tipping point where we're about to hit desensitization to gun violence. At the time that the rule was released, the Department of Justice stated that the new regulation assures that manufacturers, dealers, and individuals who utilize stabilizing braces to convert pistols and rifles with a barrel of less than 16 inches should comply with the rules that govern short barrel weapons. Since 2012, when the ATF stated that pistol attachments do not change the categorization of a pistol, this represents a change in the approach taken by the agency. Biden's ATF nominee David Chipman, who is President Biden's choice to lead the ATF, has some strange ideas about attack weapons and gun suppressors. Arm control supporters are happy about Chipman's nomination. He was an ATF special agent for 25 years and is now a senior policy advisor for the arm crime prevention group Giffords. This shows how important it is for the ATF head to enforce arm laws. On the other hand, people who support arm rights are worried about Chipman's views on things like suppressors and attack weapons. Anyone who has worked in law enforcement for as long as I have will tell you that silencers were not designed to protect hearing. They were designed to make it difficult for people to identify the sound of gunfire and locate active shooters, Chipman stated in a 2017 statement. In a 2017 tweet against the Hearing Protection Act, Chipman said that earplugs protect arm owners better than silencers. Chipman used to work for Americans for Responsible Solutions, a group that works to stop arm crime. The Washington Post checked the claim's truth and gave it three Pinocchios. It was in 2017 that the ATF candidate talked about the Sportsman Heritage and Recreational Enhancement Act in Congress. He said that someone using a suppressor would absolutely need to wear ear protection if they cared about their ears. The, the government is interfering with, with me being able to get a suppressor by delaying. The state house still has to vote on the bill. Nine on your side's Craig Smith looked into how much difference a suppressor makes. Their side of processing suppressors, getting involved with that. Gun enthusiasts hope lawmakers will pull the trigger and lift the ban on silencers because of fire of, of shooting deer with a, with a rifle. That the Republican-led Senate would finally hold the vote on gun safety legislation. People with their hearing, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing to have a suppressor on a rifle. Alan Rice is the state director of Arm Owners of America in New Hampshire and teaches people how to use arms. He said that arm suppressors are absolutely designed to protect hearing. Rice said that suppressors have been around for about 100 years and are used on many types of arms, such as hunting weapons and home defense arms. If someone breaks into your house in the middle of the night, you don't want to fight back and damage your hearing. You want to keep your hearing and defend yourself, he said. In a stressful situation, I know someone is not going to reach for earmuffs. Furthermore, he said that suppressors are not like the ones seen in the movies. They do not make arms quiet. People who own arms instead use suppressors to lower the decibel level of the sound their arms make when they go off to a level that will not damage hearing. In an interview with the Virginia pilot in 2019, Chipman said that a silencer makes an arm sound kind of like a handgun. This was after 12 people and the shooter were slayed in a mass slaying in Virginia Beach. Before carrying out the slaying, the shooter legally attached a suppressor to a 45 caliber handgun. This led local and federal lawmakers to write arm reform laws that ban suppressors. Chipman told NPR later that year that the main reason for a suppressor is for someone who is on the offensive to maintain the element of surprise longer. Arm owners challenge ATF nominees' stance. 
Rice said this wasn't true and used the mass slaying in Virginia Beach as an example of how suppressors don't work in general. He said that Arm Owners of America looked at active shooters across the country and found that most crooks don't use suppressors of any kind. Criminals don't really use suppressors, he told us. The bad guys are sneaky and they want to hide their arms. With a suppressor, an arm is much longer and harder to hide. Rice also said that most criminals who have arms don't want to go through the legal process of getting one, which can take up to a year in some situations. In the U.S., people who want to buy a suppressor must go to a Class 3 federally licensed arm dealer, pick out a suppressor, fill out an application with personal information, show photo ID and fingerprints, send the application and $200 fee to the ATF, and then wait for the ATF to review the application. A person who wishes to buy a suppressor needs to go to a Class 3 arm dealer, pick one out, fill out a form with all kinds of personal information, provide photo ID and fingerprints, and they have to submit the form with a $200 payment to the ATF, and the ATF will approve or deny sale with no time limit, said Rice. I view this ATF's recent Bristol Brace rule as a direct assault on veterans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, real quick, I find it interesting that my colleagues have no problem with the ATF going outside its boundaries. Is the goal of the ATF to go after and criminalize law-abiding Americans? Also, this bill was written with constitutionality in mind, so I definitely had a good feeling. While a firearm so equipped would still be regulated by the Gun Control Act, Chipman is not sure if it is possible to take attack arms away from people who are currently owning them. When Chipman wrote an opinion piece for the Roanoke Times last year, he said that he was a proud arm owner who was sometimes mischaracterized as an arm grabber. Chipman said that he supports arm safety laws that would save lives but wouldn't take arms away from people who follow the law. I am a proud and responsible arm owner, as are millions of Virginians, he wrote. I'm also allowed to carry an arm under my clothes. Richmond politicians will not scare me when they pass laws that make it harder for criminals to get arms. In fact, I'm one of the many people who want it. The American Task Force is a branch of the Department of Justice that works to protect people from criminal groups and activities, such as the illegal use and trafficking of weapons. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.